want to wish all of you a very uh, joyous, prosperous New Year. And we are still celebrating the octave of Christmas. So the Christmas season actually lasts until the baptism of our Lord. Some people think it lasts until Epiphany, but it's really the baptism of our Lord. This year, it's very, the Christmas season is very short. I guess Easter will probably come early. But the eight days after Christmas, it's referred to the octave, and every one of those days is a great solemnity. We're still focused on the birth of Jesus. What a wonderful, magnificent event that is, God becoming one of us, living amongst us as one of us. And notice in today's gospel reading, it mentions that eight days after his birth, he was circumcised and given the name Jesus. Well, this was the Jewish custom. So every male, eight days after birth, they would be circumcised and given their name. Now, some people ask the question, well, how does this fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah? Recall how Isaiah had prophesied, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, a bear a son and they shall call him Emmanuel, not Jesus. Is there a discrepancy in here? Not necessarily. You see, sometimes when we translate, we lose a sense of the meaning. So to give a name to someone or to call someone by a name, it's really the same thing. So basically what, I, what Isaiah was saying is that he will be called Emmanuel because he is God with us. So literally the word Emmanuel means God with us. The word Jesus means God saves. So it is a fulfillment of that prophecy, and it's a reminder to us that Jesus is God. Now, when we think of today's solemnity, it's the solemnity of Mary, the Holy Mother of God. As I mentioned, we're still focused on Christmas, and so it's interesting that the solemnity isn't called the Holy Mother of Jesus. It's called the Holy Mother of God to emphasize that Jesus is God. Now, some people and... Um, especially when we look at the history of the church, some people in the past, uh, for example, Nestorius, questioned, is it correct to call Mary the mother of God? How can God have a mother? If God were to have a mother, it would mean that his mother would be somehow superior to him or would have authority over him. God who is almighty, God who is eternal, how can he have a mother? So Nestorius argued, well, Mary can't really be the mother of Jesus because he is God. She can only be the mother of his human nature. But mothers aren't mothers of human natures. Mothers are mothers of persons. And so Mary is correctly the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is God. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. And God humbled himself to become one of us, and in becoming one of us, he subjected himself to an earthly mother and to an earthly father. Now, it's true that God had made Mary to be a perfect mother, a mother with an immaculate heart, a mother with the potential for tremendously great love, partially not just because God wanted a perfect mother for himself, but also because God knew that Mary would become the spiritual mother for all of us. So she had to have this ability, this capacity to love all of us, very similar to how God loves us. And we could say the same about St. Joseph. So God had given special graces to St. Joseph. They still had to choose freely. They still had to cooperate with God's grace. So God, in humbling himself, experienced what it was like to be in the womb for nine months. God experienced what it was like to be an infant. So God subjected himself to an earthly mother, an earthly father. He humbled himself in doing these things, but he also entrusted himself. And this, there's a very important lesson here for all of us that we too need to entrust ourselves first and foremost to God, but also to Mary and Joseph. Now notice in today's second reading, Paul's letter to the Galatians, you know, it, it mentions that, um, that we receive adoption to sonship. 
So because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then also heir through God. So in other words, we are the adopted children of God and we are heirs. In other words, we have the inheritance that God is going to offer us, which is our heavenly homeland. So we have a claim on that because we have been adopted. Now, when we think of adoption, we all know what it means to be adopted. But, you know, in the past, sometimes when they referred to royalty, the line of royalty, they would refer to them as blue bloods. You may have heard that term, blue blood. It refers to royalty. And it kind of implies that they have somehow a different genetic material or some other somehow different from everyone else. And part of the reason they call them blue bloods is because, you know, most people would go out and work in the fields and they would get tanned and you wouldn't see their veins. But people who were in royalty, they would stay inside. Their, their skin was very fair, very white, very thin. And you could see their veins and their veins looked blue. So they call them blue bloods, as if they were somehow different. So it refers to this genetic line of the royalty from one generation to the next. So even if somebody in the royalty or the royal family were to adopt someone, that adopted child would never become a blue blood. In other words, they wouldn't have the genetic line of the royalty within them. So they may benefit by being adopted, but they wouldn't become blue blood. But when God adopts us, when we are adopted into God, we do become blue bloods. In other words, we receive royalty, divinity. In other words, God enters into us. God dwells within us. God transforms us to make us a new creation. So it's not just words that you're a new creation. We are actually a new creation when we are baptized God dwells within us. We are transformed. Somebody who's in a state of mortal sin and they go to confession and they have their sin forgiven, they come out different from when they went in. They are a new creation because God dwells within them. They have the blood of God or the, the life of God within them. They are like blue bloods. We're royalty. And it's a reminder to us that God loves each and every one of us and desires our salvation. And he gives an example for all of us to imitate. So he humbled himself in becoming man. He entrusted himself to the care of Mary and Saint Joseph. And this is something he wants us to do. First and foremost, to entrust ourselves to him, to consecrate ourselves to him. Secondly, what the church recommends is consecrating ourselves to God through Mary and through Saint Joseph. In other words, consecrating ourselves to them. And basically what that means is that we turn our entire life over to them. And people think, oh my gosh, I can't do that because then I'm, I'm renouncing my freedom. I could never do that because I want to be my own master. I want to be my own God. I want to do my own thing. I don't want to have to answer to someone or to have somebody have greater authority or influence over me? Well, when we do this, we don't lose our freedom. We could reject our dependence on God. We could reject our dependence on Mary and Joseph. Recall how our Lord says that unless you become like little children, you can never enter the kingdom of God. Little children, they're innocent. They're humble. They look up to their parents and they depend upon their parents for so many things, things that they take for granted. Parents do so much for children. So we, in like manner, ought to trust and dedicate ourselves, consecrate ourselves to God, to Our Lady, to Saint Joseph to surrender our entire lives to them, knowing that what they desire for us is the very best thing for us. And in doing this, we don't lose our freedom. We basically just choose to be under their care, under their patronage, under their protection, under their providential guidance for all of us. And if we do this, not only will they help us to make it to heaven, but they will help us in every aspect of our lives 
here and now, so that we will be happier even here and now.